here we will be discussing the chemical basics of nucleic acids and I mentioned chemical because it's really difficult to discuss their function without really going into the biology portion of this topic. Whenever we talk about nucleic acids, we always remember two major types, the RNA and the DNA, which we will know increasingly by the detail as we go further. But essentially, they have something to do with the field of genetics, genes, traits, heredity, and things like that. And I think it would be highlighted in terms of how this happens in the first place when we discuss the so-called central dogma of molecular biology, which will try to, in a way, link together nucleic acids and proteins. For now, we concentrate on strictly nucleic acids, and we can call them as polynucleotides meaning that they are made of uh, building blocks or monomers called nucleotides. If you ask how many, it's actually the longest of the biomolecules. Proteins can be made up of uh, tens or hundreds or thousands of uh, amino acids, but nucleic acids are on a whole different level. Here we're talking of literally millions in the case of DNA. So, in our nucleotide, wherein we have millions of them in every DNA strand, a nucleotide has actually three further parts, so it's, it's to say that the building block has three building blocks of its own, and those are the phosphate, 5-carbon sugar, and the nitrogenous base. Phosphate is phosphate as we know it, PO4-3. The 5-carbon sugar will give us two choices. So welcome back our furanoses, which have five carbons, one, two, three, four, five. This one is ribose, and this one is basically just the OH converted to H. We lost an oxygen, so clearly this is called deoxy, loss of oxygen, deoxy ribose. And of course, this is the basis for the first letter of RNA and DNA. That's why the complete word for, or the complete meaning of RNA is ribo, ribo, nucleic acid, and DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid, okay? So this is what differentiates RNA from DNA. Now, the third one is called the nitrogenous base, or basically base, and the nitrogenous base can be discussed further. Let's set that aside first. Because I want to mention that occasionally we will be encountering a word called nucleoside. This is not the same as the word nucleotide, although it's quite close. Nucleosides only contain the nitrogenous base in the sugar, but you can clearly see it does not include the phosphate with it. So the nucleoside only has two components, whereas the nucleotide has three. So one way to put it is a nucleotide can be thought of as a nucleoside with a phosphate or a nucleoside is a nucleotide without a phosphate. Now, let's go back to the base because we have a lot to talk about with them. So there are two major chemical classes of nitrogenous bases which have these core structures. So both of them are actually, well, from the word nitrogenous, nitrogenous heterocycles. And their names are the following. The monocyclic one with two nitrogens and six members is called pyrimidine. The bicyclic one with a five-membered and a six-membered component is called pyrimidine. So the three bases here are called the pyrimidine bases. They're just the pyrimidines. And then these two right here are called the purines, or the purine bases. And I already put their names actually. I also put the uh, characteristic substituents in color just for us to easily tell them apart. It really depends on what you're supposed to study. If you are told to memorize them, then I'm going to give you a clue. If not, then you can just skip this part of the discussion. So among the three pyrimidines, we have cytosine, which is the easiest one to distinguish because it's the only one with an amino group um, attached to the ring, whereas uracil and thymine are both di dions, okay? They have two double bond O's or carbonyl groups. 
Now, to differentiate uracil and thymine, since they're both dions and they both have a double bond, in fact, all, all of them have, thymine has an extra methyl group right here, which, well, you can think of thy as a portion of methyl. So that's something that thymine has that uracil doesn't have. In fact, the methyl group is the thing which thymine has that no other of the four bases have. Quite unique. For the two purines here, we have adenine and guanine. Adenine is very easy because you literally need to copy-paste the purine structure and just add an amino group on top. Amino, so maybe you can use that to remember adenine. But guanine has a lot more going on with it. It has an amino group adjusted here, and then the top part has instead a carbonyl group. Okay? And uh, there are a lot of mnemonics. It depends on, you know, of course, your instructor or whatever notes you have, even in the country that you live in. But you can easily make ones for these uh, three and the, these two. Now, we will actually have to assemble them because remember, despite the fact there are a lot of things going on here, that's just one of three parts of the nucleotide. So, later on, we're going to have to assemble them together in order to look at a nucleotide. But before we try to assemble them, it's also nice to know how to use their nomenclature or the way that we name them. Of course, here, I literally just copy-pasted the five names here, adenine, guanine, cytosine, uracil, thymine. But once it becomes a nucleoside, in other words, once they have a sugar with them, be it ribose or deoxyribose, their name slightly changes. Okay, well, the good thing about this one is that the prefix is still the same, but the suffix will not be the same. And first, for the two purines, it's easy because all you need to do is to remove the suffix, original one, and then replace it with osine. For the three pyrimidines, it's uh, just going to be slightly different. So use the same uh, prefix, site, ur, and thyme. Okay. And then just end with the suffix of, of pyrimidine, which is, uh, sorry, not including the M, edine. So cytidine, uridine, and thymidine. That's it. Now, of course, this is for nucleoside, meaning base plus sugar. Once we have a nucleotide, remember I just told you a while ago, nucleotide is just a nucleoside with phosphate, then you just add the suffix phosphate. Uh, just uh, to let you know, you can have as much as three phosphates, although you can have two or one phosphate only. So that would account for the suffixes monophosphate, diphosphate, and triphosphate. If ever your sugar is deoxyribose, you need to add the prefix deoxy. So you can imagine guanosine being deoxyguanosine or uridine being deoxyuridine. And then also, in the case of a monophosphate, if you, if for example, like imagine if I try to write it down, cytidine monophosphate, it's a lot of letters. So what you could actually uh, use are alternatives, although these are more of the old school suffixes. It's not used a lot um, in technical uh, aspects, although in, 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 in a lot of other fields, you can still see this being used. The suffix is elic acid and elate. So instead of calling, let's say, uridine monophosphate as such, you can just call it uridilic acid or uridilate. So that's uh, one way to make things easier, at least for you to write. Now is the time to link our three parts together. So let's start with this one. Before I continue, notice the way I numbered my sugar. One prime. 2 prime, 3 prime, 4 prime, 5 prime. And of course, this is something we need to deal with. Why do we need to put a prime here? Why not just use 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? Well, when we go back to this one, I didn't even talk about it a while ago, but notice that there's a certain numbering we follow for pyrimidine and purine. And that number will stay. So this would still be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, if I call this 1, it would be confusing because if I call this number 1 and I also call this number 1, 
it's ambiguous and we don't want that. So from now on, remember that all numbers in the 5-carbon sugar would have a prime in them. Now, let's say we have a ribose molecule here and this one is, hopefully you can remember from the previous slide, it's uracil. The first thing that could happen is that the nitrogen here could attach to this carbon number 1 and then this would be accommodated by the loss of water, so that would be removal of water. So there's a condensation between the nitrogen number 1 and the carbon 1 prime, giving us a structure like this. Now, since we have a combination of a sugar and a base, remember, we call such thing a nucleoside. Okay? And how do we call this? We call this uracil. But how do we call this now? Remember, all we have to do once we have a nucleoside is to replace the suffix with, well, for uracil since it's a pyrimidine edine. So actually, despite the fact it looks quite intimidating, the entire name of this thing is just uridine. Period. Of course, if this is a nucleoside, we need to know how would it become a nucleotide. Remember, the only thing that makes a nucleoside a nucleotide is a phosphate. So we can imagine this molecule right here trying to interact with the phosphate right here. And uh, this could uh, attack this one with the subsequent release of this OH. Essentially, this would lead to some kind of condensation also with the release of water, although the details aren't really complete. But the point is, the phosphate here, one of its oxygens, will attach to this carbon, which we know is carbon 5 prime. So here the name becomes different. Since uridine now has one phosphate, we can now call the entire thing here uridine monophosphate. And just to remind you, since uh, we have this one, we can give it alternative names. We can call it instead as uridylic acid or even shorter, uridylate. Of course, since this one already has a phosphate, this is now a full-fledged nucleotide, not anymore just a nucleoside. It's also important for us to know the name of the bonds here. Well, it actually depends on whether your level of biochemistry includes the name of the bonds here. But remember this, for the bond between the sugar and the base, since it includes a sugar right here, and it's connected to a nitrogen, we call this an N-glycosidic bond. And if you're even more concerned with complete details, since remember, the carbon 1 prime is the anomeric carbon of ribose, and it points upwards, it's supposed to be given the symbol beta. So you can call the entire thing beta and glycosidic bond. You can even go further and, and say, um, isn't this N1? So you can even call this beta N1 glycosidic bond. This is kind of important. It really depends on how much you want to make this complete. For purines, by the way, the attachment point of ribose is nitrogen number 9, which is actually the nitrogen here on the 5 membered portion. Anyway, we will see this later. Now, let's go here to the bond between the sugar and the phosphate. And this one is instead called a phosphoester bond. Phosphoester bond. Because it somehow resembles an ester. Remember, an ester is RC double bond o OR. And this one, in a way, is like that. P double bond o OR. So, but instead of carbon, we have phosphate, so we call this phospho ester. Okay, again, and glycosidic bond for a bond between sugar and base, phosphoester, sugar, and phosphate. Now let's try to do a little more practice. Name these two here. You can pause if you want to do the task or just follow me here. So I'll answer this first. So it all starts with identifying the base. This one, very distinct methyl group right here. So this one is thymine. And you have to be careful. Do not skip the sugar because it, not all the time it's ribose. For example, this one is actually deoxyribose. 
And we have here not just one, but two phosphates. Now, since I have two phosphates here, I think it would be important to note that the bond between two phosphates, especially considering the entire moiety here, is called a, well, this one in particular is called the phosphoanhydride bond. And if you want to ask why is it called a phosphoanhydride, I included the two P double bond O's to resemble an anhydride. Remember, an anhydride is R C double bond O, O C double bond O, R. Kind of like twin towers, and that's what you are seeing right here. But instead of carbons, we have phosphates. Okay? And it's very important because they're actually described as high energy bonds, H E B. High energy bond. Which means the more phosphates they actually have in a nucleotide, the more uh, potential energy it has within it, which is kind of important when I talk about it in the future, especially metabolism. So we're ready to name the entire thing, okay? Since we have thymine with a base, we can call this thymidine. Remember, the suffix becomes edine for pyrimidines. And since I have two phosphates, this one is diphosphate. Also, there was a rule here. If your sugar is deoxyribose, you need to add the prefix deoxy. So the complete name is deoxythymidine diphosphate. Finally, for this one, let's see what we have here. The base, this time, it's bicyclic, so obviously it's a purine. This one with the carbonyl group is specifically guanine. The base here, luckily it's ribose, so you don't need to add the prefix deoxy later on. And I have one, two, three phosphates with uh, two anhydride bonds, so this is a triphosphate. Assembling all that, we have guanine. The suffix, once it becomes a nucleoside, is osine, so it's guanosine. And I have three phosphates, triphosphate. Okay, um, since it's not deoxyribose, I don't have to add the prefix deoxy. Also, in textbooks, especially when we go to metabolism, you will find these nucleotides abbreviated every single time. So, for example, deoxythymidine diphosphate would be written like this, DTDP, and guanosine triphosphate would be written as GTP. Indeed, if I actually change this to, imagine I change this to adenine, that would actually give us the name adenosine triphosphate. Which, if you can remember from, let's say, your high school biology classes, is said to be the most common unit of energy as far as metabolism is concerned. And it makes sense now because given that we have three phosphates for adenosine, that would mean I have two high energy anhydride bonds here compared to adenosine, di let's say, diphosphate or monophosphate. This one has the most energy given it has the most phosphates and most high energy bonds. That is why triphosphates are chosen as energy sources rather than their di or monophosphate counterparts. Oh, and by the way, one last note. Notice that the nitrogen here from the five-membered ring, which is actually N9, is the one which is attached for, to the sugar. This is the case for purines. Again, one for pyrimidines.